you had one superpower, what would it be? Just curious. It, by the way, if you're online, I would, you can actually type it out. I don't want everyone yelling it out because I know you guys are probably going to pick like Superman or flying. And I will tell you the one superpower I wish I had. And yes, I use the word wish. It's a desire. It's a hope. It's a dream. It'll never happen. I wish I had the ability to remember all the names of the people I meet. <laughs> How many have met someone two, three, four times and you know you still don't know their name? So you do things like, what's going on, pal? <laughs> right? By the way, if I ever call you pal, you should just know. I don't remember your name. That's my go-to one. And then you're like, well, you didn't call me pal. You called me bud. That's because I probably should know your name, so I'm switching it up just a little bit. What's going on, bud? What's going on, pal? Or hun, sweetie, like if you're a female, like I'm just trying to be super nice, and it's probably because I don't remember your name. Not because I don't love you. It's I lack the superpower that I desire, and God refused to give to me. He gave me something known as short-term memory only. So when I'm in front of you, I love you a lot. But then I move on with life. Oh, and I forgot everything I just went through. So that is actually a benefit that I have with being a pastor. And here's why. You don't have to remember my name. You know, you can come up to me and go, what's going on? Pastor. See, I love titles. I don't know a single one of my doctor's name. You know why? I don't have to. I can just walk up and go, what's going on, doc? Right? And it's like, I care about you, but I know you by your title because I've never taken time to get you to know you personally, probably because I don't ever want to see you again. Right? I mean, with my doctor, that makes sense. I mean, I don't want to see my, no, not you guys. <clears throat> okay, apparently I need to clarify this a little bit. The vast majority of you I want to see all the time. I just need to be honest. There's some. No, like... <clears throat> But if I'm not seeing my doctor all the time, no, I don't remember his name, so I just call him doc. And when I have to look up in the phone to call, I don't look up, well, I don't know his name. I look up doctor because I put it in the title. And here's the thing. The reason I know his title and not the person is because I don't know the person. I only know him by title. And for 4,000 years, I know that's a huge number, the vast majority of all relationship with God was through something known as a title. So for those online, for those sitting here now, I'm going to just throw up some titles that we have for God in the Old Testament. And by the way, he was known as something like the father, but it was only mentioned 15 times, but never in direct correlation to a conversation with him. It was just one of many titles. It was El Shaddai, the God who is the almighty. It's the, I mean, you guys have heard of this one, Jehovah right? Have you ever heard of Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Raphi, Jehovah? I mean, there's all these different titles that go along with it. Jehovah Shalom. You, I know you've heard the word Shalom before for peace. The Lord of peace. God was filled with nothing but titles. And every time the children of Israel wanted to talk to God, they had to figure out which title they needed to pull from. So if they needed protection, they prayed to that title. When they wanted peace in their life, they wanted that title. When David would write Psalms and he's talking about like an everlasting God, he would put that title in there. But then we fast forward to a guy named Jesus. This is known as the New Testament or New Covenant. Jesus shows up and the disciples always watch Jesus kind of, and usually what he did is kind of go into a garden or off by himself and he would have a conversation with God and then he would come back in. And one day the disciples said, would you teach us how to pray? And Jesus is like, I absolutely can do that. And we're going to read this out of Matthew chapter 6. But Jesus, when he said, I will teach you how to pray, he started in the most scandalous way possible to what those early, if we can say this way, early Christians, early disciples would have thought. Here's how he started it. After this manner, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, pray our Father. The word there is Abba. Or let me say it this. Jesus said, rather than referring to pastor, rather than referring to a title, rather than referring to someone you have no relationship, start your prayer by saying, hey, daddy. And this was mind-blowing to the disciples at this time because there was this belief in the early, in the early um, again, I'll just use the phrase early church, even though we're not quite there time-wise, but there's this early church 
rabbis, the Jewish people, that the only way to actually approach God was through this sacrifice, through this priest, through this Holy of Holies, and no one was able actually ever to walk up and just talk to God. And Jesus, on day number one, said this to him. I not only want you to have a personal conversation with your God, I want you to start it not with Savior, not with Almighty God, not with El Elohim, not with Jehovah Jireh, not with any of these things. I need you to start with, hey, Papa, can we talk? So as we, can, as we are talking about prayer and fasting in this month, I want to start by saying this. I invite you to have a personal conversation with Jesus as if he was your dad and you were sitting on his lap. If that's the picture that you need to have, and you may, you may say to me this, and I get this, I didn't know my dad, my dad was abusive, my dad was a horrible man, I would never do that to my father. Okay, think about this. Somewhere in your brain, there's the dad you wish you had. And we all, we all have that, right? Because I know this and I'm barely a parent. I'm already failing my kids. I, I, there, there is somewhere in my life that I'm falling short, that I'm not doing it correctly, or their broken psyche is messing with my broken belief system, and I'm instilling something wrong inside of it. So I understand that there should be some flawedness there, but we all have, can we say this, that perfect Santa Claus on December 20th that we want to sit in his lap and tell him what we want. So imagine walking up and saying, dear Papa, so what is prayer? Well, on page 31 of our book, Starving, you probably don't have your book with you, which is fine. I'll read it to you. On page 31, okay, yeah, I love you right now. <laughs> Time for a little insight. The rest of the team loves this digital thing so they can take their book anywhere they want. Responsible people can think ahead and take it with them, but I'm just... Number two, science shows you that when you turn something in your hand, you re re remember it more. So call me old school. I still have a book. Would you like to grab a mic and jump up here? Because I can feel it. I can feel it happening. So what is prayer? Prayer is simply, and this is page 31. I love the way he uh, defines it in, in, in the book here. Prayer is simply the activity which intentionally directs our communication with Christ resulting in our growing more fully with him. So what is prayer? We're going to intentionally turn our community, uh, communication to Christ. And when we say to Christ, it's not the old man sitting in heaven with a long beard, a robe and a cane, waiting for you to mess up so he can smite you. That's King James for you right there. It's not that. It's your dad would like to have a conversation with you today. And so Jesus now, uh, let, me, let me take, can I give you 30 seconds of just a, a side note so you have this in proper context? The Lord's Prayer that we're going to read is the same structure or outline that if you were going to read the Ten Commandments. And here's what I mean by that. The Ten Commandments are not the only laws that we're supposed to live by. The Ten Commandments is a framework in which the laws of God fit under, okay? So you might have heard Jesus say this when he was challenged, what is the greatest commandment? And the answer was, love the Lord your God with all your heart, right? And then second to this is love thy neighbor as yourself. So that's not the only two rules. Here's what Jesus was trying to say. When it comes to your life, if you understand how to properly relate to God and how to properly relate to others, this is how you keep all the commandments. Not just keeping those two, keeping the confines of the structure in which he's teaching us. So Jesus today is going to teach us the structure on which to pray, not how to pray this every time. If every time you get up and you say to Jesus, my father, my father, you, my daddy, my daddy, um, holy is your name, um, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. If that's how you pray to God, I doubt that's how you talk to anyone else. Jesus is teaching us to start by just saying this, hey, dad, hey, dad, which is in heaven? I, I love this because we give his address because I have a dad that lives on the other side of Collinsville. And if I got up to you today and said, hey, I talked to my dad this week about today's sermon, you may be thinking your, your dad who was a retired preacher or 
Like, who are you talking about? No, I talk to my Abba Father, which is in heaven. Is there any questions about that? Which is in heaven, which also means to be deaf, is separate from me. Different from this earthly struggle that I'm in, he's in this heavenly realm, a place of perfection and peace, and I'm calling into that place. And in doing that, I'm going to let you know, God, holy is your name. And by the way, if you're wondering, yes, we're going through the entire Lord's Prayer right now to break it down for you. And if you think we're going to be able to cover every jot and tittle of what this prayer is about, you're dead wrong. Why? Because the time keeps on ticking, ticking, ticking. I was just seeing who was going to be a pagan like me this morning. Yeah. So the next thing we say to him, our father, our dad, who you're in heaven, holy is your name. Holy means other than me, separate than me, perfection outside of humanity. We have to understand, this is a, let, let's say it this way. Here's a tension to keep in your prayer life because he wants you to come to him as father. But I've heard people, when they say they talk to God the way they talk to everybody else, I would encourage you not to even talk to everybody else like that. But God can't handle bluntness. God can't handle honesty. But what we also have to recognize, that this is a holy God. This is a set-apart God from us, and there should be some level of reverence when it comes into the house. And I'll, I'll tell you an example of, for my kids. The way my kids talk to me is as a papa, as a dad papa. I've never called myself papa a day in my life. It, I, I go with dad. And by the way, when I have grandchildren, I want to be known as grandpa. All these new terms for grandpa. Pappy, Papa, uh, Boss, all these different ones that are out there. Just call me Grandpa. I'm old-fashioned. I want a book to have in my hand, and I want my kids to call me Grandpa. Don't know if it'll happen, but there we go. By the way, that had nothing to do with what I'm talking about. But my kids, they call me Dad, right? And they know where I live. But there are some times, like when my daughter the other day, she said to me, yo, bro, She's six. And here's the thing. I did say to her, you don't call me bro. Like there is a separation between what you're allowed to call everybody else. You can call me dad and relate, but you're not going to call me bro. And there are times when I'm talking with the kids and let's just be honest, correcting and instructing them. And they go, fine, dad. Hang on. This is not a fine dad moment. This is a yes, sir moment, right? So when we talk to our holy God, there are times that we have to understand who it is we're uh, approaching. And I promise you this, if you just lost your spouse, and if you come before God and said, most holy, uh, anointed God, king of the universe, who transcends time and space, God's up there going, uh-uh, don't talk to me like that. You just lost your spouse. You come in and go, God, I'm hurting. I'm mad. And why is she gone? Why is he gone? I just got the news that I have cancer. God, why did I do something wrong? Like you can process everything you want. Go talk to your holy God. But there is a time and a place where we also understand that he is a holy God separate than us. And we can come to him with reverence. And it is okay to say to him, king of kings. Lord of lords, creator of everything, sustainer of my life. There are times where I want to tell him who he is. But we can come to him in both ways. You know why? Because dad is calling us close. So our father, which art in heaven, and yes, this is the King James Version. I think it is the most poetic that is written. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. <coughs> <coughs> thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I would like to point out something. Yet in our prayer example that Jesus has given us, yet has Jesus told us how to ask for something. Okay, I'll go say it to this side. This side doesn't care. Hey, guys, can we talk for a second? I, I love you a lot right now. And while I do this, everyone's going to, like, applaud. Actually, say hi to your next neighbor and say, are you ready for what's coming? Are you ready for what's coming? Amen. 
so two Sudafeds don't dry it up before you get up here. So I apologize about that. So thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'd like to point out as Jesus is teaching us to pray, he didn't start with this. When you go to talk to your father, immediately give him your list of demands. You know what prayer started with? It's worship. Giving God worth because if we start with just telling God everything we need versus everything he is, who's actually God in this situation? Our want or the one we're wanting? So we start with worship. And then in starting with worship, we go into this. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So by the way, for anyone, and, and I know I'm just kind of going to poke here for fun. If you think any day we're going to like fly out of here, just so you know, Jesus' prayer says that he's coming. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And here's another way we can kind of say it. So everything that I'm about to talk to you about, God, if it goes against your predestined, ordained plan here on earth, that may not be your kingdom, and it could just be my selfishness. So God, align me with what you want. And I will give you a hint. If you think you need to be praying because the lottery ticket's at a billion dollars, and if you say, God, if you give this to me, I'll, first of all, he paves his road with gold. He don't need your money. Thank you, Pastor Aaron. So I don't know why you went gangster on that, but you did. So <clears throat> he doesn't need your money. And if you think you can negotiate with God, there's a chance you don't have a lot of money now because you can't deal with a little bit. His will is for you not to implode personally. So the last thing he's going to do is give you the stress of a billion dollars. So when you start praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, you're actually saying, God, there's places in my life in my life that I'm out of alignment with you. So bring me into alignment. So the very thing I'm praying for that's currently in heaven, I don't know if you remember this, we already gave his address, the thing that's in heaven next to your holiness as it comes out of that holy place onto this earth, if I'm not aligned with you, basically means that I'm out of holiness sake and the moment I get the thing you're giving to me, I'm gonna make it unholy. So God, let me align with you so that I can bring that thing that you have in heaven. I guarantee the healings that God has in heaven, he wants here on earth. He's waiting for an alignment on our side. He wants prosperity. He wants clarity. He wants next generation. He wants these things. God, where am I out of alignment so that thy kingdom come? Not David's kingdom. Because you know what David's kingdom is? I'll give it to you in one word. Really, really, it's selfishness. I don't mean to be. I don't want to be, but at the end of the day, I don't think there's anyone I like more than me. Can anybody else say that? Hang on, about yourself, because I know you're not going to raise your hand for me, right? It's not about our kingdoms. Would we be willing to give up our castles for his kingdom? And in the prayer that Jesus teaches, now you will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. This is just absolutely fantastic. Give us this day our daily bread. Let, you know what? Let's bring up Mariah. I'm going to bring up my kids and probably my wife a lot because this past Friday, my wife left me for a trip. I feel like it was a long pause, but I was just seeing if you were paying attention. And it's funny because some of you were like, told you she would. Like, like, like I, I, I've, I've already outplayed my coverage with her. I'm aware of that, but... So she just went on a trip. So Mariah on Friday, as Cammie's finishing packing to go out of town, Mariah comes around the corner before school. She's eating fruit snacks. 8 a.m. No, earlier than that, 7.30. I go, what, what are you eating? Those are a snack. They're, it's in its very name. <laughs> I need you to have breakfast. And none of that name is in there. And Mariah looked at me and said, a mommy said I could. And I looked at Cam and she goes, well, I'm going out of town and it's a Friday. <laughs> That's the logic you're using? Thank God you're gone. I can train the children right. <laughs> I figured I'd have time for a drink after that comment and I was right. Here's the thing. If I left it up to my children, they would eat fruit snacks every meal. But you know what they need sometimes? Broccoli. 
They need Brussels sprouts. And you went, oh, Brussels sprouts are gross. Not when you fry them in enough bacon fat, it's not. <laughs> make anything good. I can make a wet sandal taste good enough bacon fat. If my kids had their way, we would eat chocolate donuts every morning for breakfast. But some, I love you back there. Whoever said amen, I'm with you. Are you, are you, are you, do you like them cream filled? You're a jelly guy, aren't you? I can tell you're a jelly guy. I'm sorry, Mary. So you have, look, I remember the name. God, supernatural power is here. We thank you for that. <clears throat> but here's the thing. If I only gave them what they wanted, they'd never get what they need. So God today, I trust you to give me my daily bread. And sometimes that daily bread is honoring. Sometimes that daily bread is joy. Sometimes that daily bread is misunderstandings. Has anyone ever had that daily bread before? Where you're in the middle of a conversation and it falls apart and you go, what's, what's happening? Why is this? What, why, I, did I, I didn't say that to you. Why are you saying that to me? It, it, sometimes our daily bread is broken trust. Sometimes our daily bread is injustice. And guess what? That broccoli bread and that chocolate bread both can give you nourishment to become the person that God is talking to you about. Because there's a, there's a prayer out there, and I, I don't have it printed. You can look for it yourself. It said, God, I ask for patience, so you brought me people to teach me patience. <laughs> God, I ask to help with my anger issues, so you gave me children. <laughs> right? It's amazing what we ask for isn't what God gives us in return. It's the tool that it takes to put us on the process that we need to be in in order to develop into a sanctified individual that God wants us to be. And sometimes we got to choke down that bread. And at the end of the day, can we finish in our prayer life by saying, God, Thank you for this bankruptcy that I didn't plan on. Because my guess is, in that bankruptcy that you're facing, you're going to learn more about finances than if you would have got that million-dollar jackpot. So, God, I ask you to make me fiscally responsible and look at what you've done. You brought me to the place. My only option is to be fiscally responsible because no one's going to give me another credit card. Not another family member is going to bail me out, right? And so we have to get to the point where we thank God for our daily bread, whatever that bread may be in our life, to nourish us and to grow us and to forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. I love that Jesus slapped this right on the back of the daily bread because here's why. Most of the time, the waiters of your life that bring you the worst daily bread are the ones you're going to hold on against. It's, wouldn't it be, it, it, we know we do this. If you get in a fight in your life, and it's something that kind of haunts you, something that kind of sticks with you, and I, you know, I'll, I'll, here's, she's not here, so here we go. <laughs> no, this is, this is a bad one. So in the book Starving, Jesus is watching. I love you right now. You, you ain't kidding. And so, uh. In the book Starving, one of the things it warns us about is, hey, as you jump into this thing, just know the enemy may come under, you may come under attack with the enemy. And Cammy and I, we get into this thing, we're reading it, we're checking in with each other, we're talking, and one night as we're heading towards bed, we decide to get in the biggest fight that we've been in for 10 years. Ready for this? Over a 15-second TikTok clip. When I say that this fight meant nothing, it's beyond that. And we're never the couple. We don't normally go to bed angry at all. If we go to bed angry, the next morning, one of us is at the kitchen table to solve it the next day. Both of us were absent the next morning. And here's what happened. I became so focused on the TikTok anger that I never focused on the daily bread of what I could have learned in this horrible situation with my wife. And until I began to forgive, which by the way, you may ask, so it was her fault. No, it was ours. In case you're in a relationship, it's our fault. It's always our fault. 
And if you live with that belief system, you'll get over things a lot faster. Because us will come together to say, what part did I own in this? Because there was some daily bread I clearly needed to eat. But instead, I would rather jump to the next line and say, God, I'm not forgiving those debts as you forgave mine. But if I would have gone one step further and just said, God, teach me how to forgive. Ready for this? And I promise, it was me that started. Help me forgive a 15-second TikTok clip. That was the thing I was focused on. And by the way, I know right now you're looking at me just going, I can't believe that guy got hung up on that. Let me come talk to you and your spouse for a couple minutes. You're dumb too. <laughs> so we're all on the same page, right? If you're taking notes, it's D-U-M-B. Okay, I mean, we're all there. But here's the thing. We had, it was a block of time till we were reconciled because I wasn't forgiving my debtors. I would rather hold her in the jail of my mind than open the door of my heart. I would rather keep her in the jail of my mind than open the door of my heart. How many people are in the jail of your mind right now and every time you walk by the cell, they're rattling the cages reminding you of what they owe you. What they owe you. I said this to you. I did this to you. You don't have time for prayer in your life because if you started praying, you wouldn't have time to recall the memories that are holding them in prison. But if we got in more prayer, we'd probably have to open the jail cell because eventually you get to the point, I forgot why I locked them in there. God, forgive me my debts as I forgive those. Those debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Pray without ceasing. Lead us not in temptation. If you actually prayed about everything that you were going to do, I believe this is going to be one of the most powerful scriptures that you could grab onto today. Lead us not in temptation. Today, we're going to leave here, and I'm going to eventually gather all five, four, three. I'm, kids of mine, I forgot how many I have. I, I'll let them do the head count. My goal is no one's dead. Not a high standard, just a standard. I'm going to collect the kids, and I'm going to go to a grocery store. And while I'm at this grocery store, FYI, in case anyone tries to pull this clip out, this is all fake. While I'm in the grocery store, I'm going down the aisle. I look down the aisle. Ooh, there is a girl that just caught my eye. And my wife is gone. <laughs> Put this away. So, God, my prayer is to you, help me hit on this woman without her asking me what I do. Hang on a second. I'm going to pray that you don't lead me into temptation. So here's my prayer to God. God, help me as I hit on this woman and because she's sexually appealing to me. God, can you help me be able to figure out having an affair with her while Cammie is gone and it never come back to haunt me? You know, if we actually prayed about every thought that we had, I think our prayer itself will take care of those temptations that are leading us down that road. So kids, next time you have a test you're not ready for and you want to put together a little cheat sheet, why don't you just say this, God, help me write out this cheat sheet so the teacher doesn't catch me. Help me make it small enough to fit underneath my thigh, underneath my hand, tucked underneath my Apple Watch so that no one can see it. Why don't you go ahead and just say that prayer and as you say that prayer out loud, see if it doesn't sound as foolish to you as it does to God. What if we actually started praying, Lord, as I get online to look at porn today, I pray that my wife never looks at the search history. I pray that I can get away with multiple affairs and that no one tracks my credit card bill. Could you imagine? I doubt you're as physically riled up as you used to be when you got done saying that prayer to God. Could you imagine if we actually prayed about everything we wanted to do? There's a chance when temptation is there, and we say it out loud to God, there's a chance we'll go, you know what? That affair doesn't sound so good anymore. You know what? That cheating, that deceiving, that lying, that doesn't sound as good anymore. What if we actually got into it and said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil? Because God, yours is the kingdom, not my kingdom. Yours is the power. 
not the false power that I projected over my wife this past week in an argument in order for me to try to win, which, by the way, means that my spouse loses. What a horrible thing for a husband to think. I need to win, which means she needs to lose. God, I pray for proper power in my life. For thine is the kingdom and the glory forever and ever. And I know right now you're asking this question, well, when is it I'm supposed to ask God for what I need? This is the structure in which we pray. So I would start by saying this, God, I'm going to worship you this morning, this afternoon, this evening. Second thing, God, can you clean me up? So wherever I'm holding back, whenever I have unforgiveness, can you hold me back? Or can you clean me up so that as thy kingdom come, thy will be done in this world, it can help this world. Somewhere in there is that place where we go to God with our prayers and our petitions. But here's, here's what prayer can't be. As I give you kind of the structure, the outline of what prayer is. Right before in Matthew chapter 9, or Matthew chapter 6, I have the, the wrong, uh, the thing on the PowerPoint, I think. No, I do. It's Matthew chapter 6. Right before this, Jesus is talking. And he says, when you pray, in verse 5, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogue, on the street corners, to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received what it is that they want. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then the, your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will be rewarded to you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your not, Father knows what you need before you ask of it. So what is prayer? Prayer is to deepen, page 24 of, uh, of our book, Starving. It's to deepen your relationship with Jesus through the renewing of your spirit. It's to reset essential habits of your life to lead you into triumphant and victories only Jesus can produce. And it allows Christ's grace and favor to be fully restored so that you can enjoy the successor's prayer for you. Prayer is not just a dialogue. It's so much more. It is a tool to get you closer to your goal of relating with Jesus. When I say what prayer is not, today as I talk to you about pray, prayer, next week as we talk about prayer and fasting, we're going to finish up this month on the 28th for anyone who would want to join us in a three-day fast, the last three days of this month. So the final Sunday will be starting that fast. Whatever God is calling you to, whatever you feel like he's revealing, I know for my wife and I, we already feel called, we're going to be doing water only for those three days uh, of our fast to be praying for what God has for us and for our church. But as you do that, and I'm talking to you about prayer, can I tell you this? The Muslims know how to pray. When it comes to babbling three times a day, facing a direction. Now, are they praying? Are they not? Are they sincere or they not? That's not what I'm here to judge. But I'm telling you, the last thing I want you to do is have a habit of praying. Because every religion out there tells you to have a habit of praying to this celestial being that's supposedly out there. I have no desire for you to have a habit of prayer. What I want you to have is I want you to have a direct connection to your father so that when you talk to him, he has a dialogue with you. A habit of prayer does nothing but the ability that when my, have you ever had a kid in a distant room all of a sudden have that cry that you know an accident happens? Dad doesn't wait to see if that's a secondary cry. Dad is up and he is moving. The story of the prodigal son isn't a story about a, a son who lost his way. It's about a loving father who's sitting in a window looking to see if the father, if the son wants to have a conversation with him. The Bible is not just a story about man named Jesus who comes to the earth to die for us. It's the story of a heavenly father who has a desire to have a family close to him, not through some priest and an animal sacrifice in a temple once a year, but a personal relationship that when they say daddy he goes yes son 
Yes, daughter. The practice of prayer that we're calling you to is a practice of connecting with God. Because when we connect with God, it isn't to tell him, I need this, I want this, do this for me. It's a practice of connecting to God to say, I'm your son, I'm your daughter. Bring to he- uh, down to earth that which is in heaven because you know your faithful son and daughter will steward that which you give me. Please do not have a habit of praying. Have a practice of connecting to your dad. That is what prayer is about. And if you think just babbling along, Jesus says, that's how the pagans do it. And if you think that you'll come on a Saturday that we're having a prayer meeting or a Sunday morning where we're having an extra service and you'll come and you'll stand up here and you'll say, transcendent Jehovah, in which I call upon thy holy name. I ask you to thou cometh in the great stand up here. If that's how you really pray, but if you're praying it for show, you should know you got what you were looking for. And that's people to look at you. But I'd rather be found by myself in my closet and my dad with me than the whole world's attention. Because in those places, we talk to our God. So dear Heavenly Father, as we finish up today, help us just talk to you. Jesus, thank you for the outline that you gave us, the structure in which you uh, provided for us. Now, God, we fill out that structure. So, Dad, separate from us in heaven, in the holy of holies, we worship you this morning. We praise you. We honor you. We love you. We adore you. Thank you for the life that you've given to us. Thank you for the air in our lungs. Thank you for our hearts that are beating blood through our system, our minds that are quick and responsive and able to think. God, we honor you for what you've done for us and what you've given to us. And God, as I look at Navigation Church, there is not enough heaven here. I desire for your heaven to be in the midst of us as a people. I desire for your spirit to be in the midst of us as a people. I desire tongues and the interpretation of tongues. I desire miracles, signs, and wonders. God, I desire for the lost and the broken to be able to know that there is a place that they can come to, that there's a family waiting for them to bring them life and life abundant. So thy kingdom come here at Navigation Church as it is in heaven. There's worship in heaven. You're going to find worship here, God. There's there's elders sitting around your throne declaring glory of who you are. God, you're going to find us declaring who you are. And Lord, it says in heaven that there is not tears because there is no sin. There is no pain. There is no brokenness. God, the only tears we want here is that of rejoicing because of your miracle working power. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. On our earth. And so, God, as we go out of here today, whatever it takes to align us to do that, we ask for you to bring it our way. Whatever your menu of daily bread is, God, I'm going to consume it and allow it to become a part of who I am so that I can become more like you. And I don't know who's bringing me my bread today, but ahead of time, I forgive them. If it's a place of offense, God, I forgive them ahead of time. A place where I need to speak forgiveness, I speak forgiveness ahead of time. And any of the jail cells that are still locked tight, God, help me open those doors. God, I'm so tired of fighting them. I'm so tired of the words. I'm so tired of the history. I'm so tired of the pain being revisited. I forgive right now, God. I forgive those that I have put in debt. And Lord, I don't want to be tempted by sin. Because temporary pleasures take me away from my long-term goal of being closer to you. So lead me not into temptation today, God. Deliver me from this evil. Because it's your kingdom. It's your glory and it's your power we worship. If you're here today, maybe your eyes are closed already. And you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I am just going to take 30 seconds to tell you this. Jesus died for you. He wants a personal relationship with you. 
And if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, you don't have to say a big, long prayer. There's nothing specific you have to do except for this. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth for you to be saved. If you're here, could I just have everyone say this out loud so that anyone who may be feeling this this morning, can everyone here just say this, I confess you, Lord, as my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. And be Lord of my life. If you're here today and you said that prayer for the first time, or maybe even the last time, that's all that it takes for you to begin your journey and taking your next step in a growing relationship with Jesus.